الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته مساء الخير اهلا وسهلا بالحضور الكرام جود ايفنينج ويلكم تو ايفي ون 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 ويلكم تو ايفي Uh, Professor Jonas got his PhD in theoretical particle physics from Emory University in 1971. Since 1972, he was working at CERN and still he's working at CERN. Uh, he, he's been in a lot of groups at CERN. Uh, very well known person. Uh, he worked as also as a scientific advisor of uh, the general director of CERN. Uh, he got Maxwell Prize in Physics for Maxwell Medal in. In 1982, also he got the Iraq Medal in Physics in 2005. Professor Jonas is a very well known person in physics. Uh, today we have very, very pleasure to have Professor Jonas here. He's going to talk on very good subject, which is good for everyone. So, uh, basic questions we have to know. Uh, what are we? This is a simple question, but uh, in physics it is very hard to answer. Uh, from where we are coming is also very simple, but it is also we need to understand from where we are coming and for future where we are going. So, uh, please, uh, Professor Jonas, welcome again and thank you very much for coming and please start. So, uh, is this working? Yeah. So, uh, salam alaikum. It's uh, a pleasure for me to be uh, back in Bahrain. I was here for the first time uh, 10 years ago. And uh, I'm very uh, grateful to uh, Sheikh Ameh and uh, Professor Mohammed for uh, providing the opportunity to, to come back. So uh, these days we're having a little workshop for uh, high school teachers, very enthusiastic. And uh, this evening I would like to talk to you about what are we, where do we come from, where are we going? So. I've taken this title from this uh, very famous painting by Paul Gauguin who, that you see behind me. So uh, I actually had a copy of this painting uh, in my office when I was a PhD student just to uh, remind me uh, why it is that I came into work every day. Uh, it, it's still the reason why I come into work every day, although I'm afraid I lost the copy of the picture. So, so of course the perspective of these people in this painting was perhaps different from the perspective of a physicist. And as Professor Mohammed said, uh, what are we, for example, is kind of a complicated question for, for, for a physicist. But nevertheless, what I want to uh, argue in this talk is that the business of physicists in general, and particularly of us particle physicists, is to try to provide some answers to at least some of Gauguin's questions, or, or simply stated, to try to understand better what uh, the universe is made of. So, so what do we know about the universe? Well, uh, we know that uh, the universe has been ex in existence since uh, a Big Bang, about 13.8 billion years ago. Uh, we know it's very large. It's uh, about uh, 10 to the 28 centimeters of the part of the universe that we can see, and there may be a lot more that we uh, cannot see. Uh, so uh, the astronomers look, and they see stars, they see galaxies, and they look back towards the beginning. So what is the universe made of? Well. There's stars, there's planets, uh, people. Uh, we understand what they're made of. And I will describe this understanding uh, as we go through the talk. However, the astronomers tell us that in addition to the visible matter in the universe, the stars and so on, there's also invisible stuff in the space in between the stars, in between the galaxies. And that, for us, is a big puzzle uh, that perhaps we can address using the tools of particle physics. Now, looking at this picture, of course, you immediately ask, well, what happened at the time of the Big Bang? I don't think we physicists 
can tell what actually happened at time equal to zero. We're not even sure there was a time equal to zero. But we can discuss what happened very close to time equal to zero. And we can actually study the, the laws of physics that apply at that time uh, by making experiments in our laboratories. So the universe is expanding. And uh, as far as we can tell at the moment, it kind of looks like it should continue to expand forever. But this is not necessarily the case, and I will discuss the possibility that, in fact, at some point in the future, our laws of physics, our, of our universe will collapse upon itself. Okay, so I, I've talked about uh, Gogai's questions. I've uh, framed them in the context of what we know about the universe. Now let me frame these questions in the language of particle physics. So, what are we? Okay, so a physicist would rephrase that question as, what is matter made of? Now, a key aspect of that question is, why do things weigh? Uh, what is the origin of mass? Uh, this is an extremely important question, because, for example, the electron. Uh, the electron makes up atoms, but that would be impossible if the electron had no mass. If it had no mass, the electron would run around everywhere at the speed of light. What is the origin of the matter in the universe? Where do we come from? Uh, we can see that the universe contains some matter, it contains a lot of radiation, but it doesn't contain antimatter, and this for astrophysicists and cosmologists, is a puzzle. I already mentioned the dark matter. So the astronomers tell us that there's perhaps five to ten times more dark matter than there is visible matter. So at the moment, although we understand the visible matter in the universe, that's only a small fraction of the total. Where do we come from? Where are we going? Well, we think that the universe expands according to the laws of Einstein's theory of general relativity. But you have to put into Einstein's equations the appropriate forms of matter, and that's the business of us particle physicists. And in particular, by studying particle physics, we may hope to understand how it is that the universe has got to be so big and so old, and maybe also get some insights into the future of the universe. So, our job as particle physicists is at least to ask these questions and hopefully provide at least some answers. And uh, one answer that was provided in experiments at CERN, the big particle physics laboratory uh, where I've been working for many years, uh, was one answer was provided in 2012 with the discovery of the Higgs boson, named for this gentleman here, who I, I think is smiling. But to answer the other questions on the list, we're going to need physics beyond what we currently understand. And I will describe some of those possible pieces of physics in the latter part of the talk. So I'd like to uh, put the discussion in the context of this logarithmic ruler, which takes you all the way from the largest scale that we can see in the universe, 10 to the 28 centimeters, down to the smallest scale that we theoretical physicists speculate, which is 10 to the minus 32 centimeters. So what is 10 to the 28? It's a very big number. How big a number? So, so let me give you a way of thinking about it. Think of the American budget deficit. <laughs> I haven't finished yet. <laughs> you express it in cents, and you take the square, and then you've got something like 10 to the 28. So then in between this very large scale and the very small scale, we've got other scales, we've got the Earth, we've got atoms, and roughly in the middle, we've got the human scale. So it's represented here by a picture of Albert Einstein 
and his kid sister when they're about you know, a metre tall, something like that. So what do we know uh, about what they were made of and by extension what we are made of? So we know that we're made of molecules, that those molecules are combinations of atoms, that those atoms consist of clouds of electrons going around a central nucleus. In the first half of the last century, it was realized that those nuclei are made up out of objects called protons and neutrons. And then in the second half of the last century, it was realized that those protons and neutrons, in turn, are made of smaller things called quarks. So, at our current level of understanding, the smallest constituents of matter that we know about are electrons, quarks, and related particles. But, but nowhere in that description do you find a candidate for the dark matter that the astronomers and astrophysicists tell us fill the universe. So how are we going to discover the nature of this dark matter? Well, one possibility may be doing experiments in the laboratory. So I'll be talking quite a lot about the Large Hadron Collider, the LHC at CERN. So you see a picture of it uh, over there on the left-hand side. So that collider, like other particle physics experiments, can be regarded as a sort of super microscope which looks deep inside the atom, inside the proton, at the smallest possible things. But it also goes back close to the Big Bang. And so, for that reason, our experiments may provide some insights into how the universe began and, for example, where the dark matter comes from. So th there's close connections between particle physics and cosmology, and I'll be returning to this uh, later in the talk. But one thing which I wanted to remind people of is that uh, astrophysics actually played an important role in the evolution of particle physics. Because in the first half of the last century, many of the most important discoveries were made using cosmic rays. These are energetic particles coming from outer space produced by cosmic accelerators that we still don't really fully understand. But these cosmic accelerators bombard the Earth with energetic particles, and when those particles hit the upper atmosphere, their energy is converted into many other particles, and many new types of particle were discussed discovered in the first half of the last century uh, in those showers. But around the middle of the last century, uh, physicists realized that if they wanted to study those particles in detail uh, and make careful measurements, they would need to do those experiments in the laboratory. And so they built their own accelerators and they conduct experiments using detectors under controlled laboratory conditions. And that then gave birth to particle accelerators, and in particular to the laboratory CERN, where I've been working for many years, and the ultimate particle accelerator at the moment is the Large Hadron Collider, which I'll be discussing later. So what have the experiments with these particle accelerators revealed? Something that we call prosaically the standard model of particle physics. This was proposed in the late 1960s by Abdus Salam, whom you see here from Pakistan, and a couple of American theorists, Bachel and Weinberg. So, so their theory makes essential use of ideas proposed by Peter Higgs, the gentleman whom you saw a couple of slides back, Initially, I think people didn't pay very much attention to their theory. It was in the early 1970s when the first experiments at CERN provided evidence for some of the new phenomena predicted by the standard model that people started to pay serious attention. 
And uh, later on in the 1980s and 1990s, many experiments were done at CERN uh, and also at other particle physics laboratories uh, confirming predictions of this standard model of particle physics. So, so just one example. If you look at that image there, you see a little red dot. That's an experimental measurement. And you see the green line, that's the theoretical prediction. So uh, this is one instance where we theorists got it right. So what does this standard model consist of? Well, it consists of a bunch of particles. So I already mentioned the electron, which you see on the right, and the quarks, which you see on the left. Uh, in addition to the electron, uh, there's a couple of heavier, very similar particles, uh, one of them called the muon, which was discovered in cosmic rays. Uh, the universe is also sending through our bodies at this very moment enormous numbers of neutrinos, which you also see up there on the slide. Well, I won't say very much about them in this talk. So between these fundamental particles, we distinguish four different fundamental interactions. So uh, over on the left, we have gravity, described by Einstein's theory. Next along, we have electromagnetism, which is described by the theory of uh, James Clerk Maxwell, proposed about 150 years ago while he was professor at King's College, uh, London. Then on the right-hand side, we have the strong nuclear force that holds protons and neutrons together inside nuclei. And we have the weak nuclear force, which is responsible for forms of radioactivity. So what you see on this slide, uh, I like to refer to as a, the cosmic DNA. Uh, it somehow encodes all the information you need to make a star, or to make a planet, or, or to make Albert Einstein. Well, it's actually what I just said is not quite true, because on this slide, you don't have an explanation of where particle masses come from. And I remind you that this is a very important question. If, if the electron didn't have a mass, for example, there would be no atoms. Uh, if that particle called W sitting in the middle there didn't have a very large mass, uh, radioactivity would be much stronger and life would be impossible. So we need to understand where particle masses come from. So you may think, well, no, I, I've heard of mass, I think. Didn't my physics professor tell me that weight is proportional to mass? Wasn't it Newton who said that? And surely everybody remembers E equals mc squared. Energy is related to mass. However, those two distinguished gentlemen somehow forgot to explain where the mass comes from in the first place. They will eat other things to mass, but they don't tell us what mass is. So this is Peter Higgs, who in 1964 proposed a theory for where the masses of particles come from. And according to his theory, there should be as a sort of uh, signature of his particle, there should be a, a signature of his theory, there should be a particle that has come to be known as the Higgs boson. So in the years following 1964, uh, the search for this particle somehow became the particle physicist's holy grail. And uh, just can't help mentioning that he was a student at King's College London, although he had the poor taste to go to Edinburgh to do his famous work. <laughs> so I'm not going to describe his theory in any detail, but I would like to give you an analogy which may help you understand. So I, I guess you don't get much snow here. But, but just imagine for a moment that it's the middle of winter 
and you're in the middle of Siberia. So there is a big, thick field of snow extending in all directions. So the idea of Peter Hicks and, and other theorists was that in the same way you should imagine that the universe is full of what we call a field, by analogy perhaps with electromagnetic field or gravitational field. Now consider what happens when a particle goes through this Higgs field. Well, it's maybe a little bit like if you're trying to cross Siberia. So you're going to, trying to go through this medium. So if you're lucky, you're going to have skis. And you will skim across the top of the snow. You won't sink into the snow. You'll go very fast. And not sinking into the snow, that's like a particle that does not interact with the Higgs field, a particle with no mass that travels always at the speed of light, just like the skier travels very fast. But maybe you're not so lucky. Maybe you're trying to cross Siberia on snowshoes. So in that case, you sink into the snow, you go more slowly. That's like a particle that travels at less than the speed of light because it has a mass, because it interacts with the Higgs field. So if you interact with the Higgs field, you have a mass, you travel at less than the speed of light. And of course, if you don't have any snow equipment at all, and you try to walk across Siberia in your boots, you're going to interact very strongly with that Higgs snow field, like a particle with a very large mass, which travels much less than the speed of light. OK, that's the basic idea. But how do you test the idea? Well, what is snow made of? Snow is made of snowflakes. And in this analogy, there is a, a quantum of this Higgs field, which is the particle that we call the Higgs boson. So uh, you know about electromagnetic fields. You may know that there is a quantum, a particle, associated with the electromagnetic field called the photon. Exactly the same way, there is this Higgs boson, which is the quantum of this Higgs snow field. Now, this is an interesting analogy. Because, as you know, uh, a snowflake comes in many possible shapes. And that's because it's made out of molecules, which can be arranged in different ways. And in the same way, we're now arguing about whether perhaps there's many different types of Higgs boson and that there might be something inside the Higgs boson that could be arranged in different ways. But that's a discussion for the future. So this is Peter Higgs. As I said, he proposed his theory in 1964. Here he is working out some of the details of his theory in 1965. And in the next part of the talk, I'm going to be discussing how his particle was found at CERN in 2012, uh, what it may be telling us, and then we'll go on to discuss you know, what might be there beyond the Higgs boson. So I, I should declare a personal interest in this. Uh, I started working on the Higgs boson in uh, 1975, together with Mary Gaillard and uh, Dimitri Nanopoulos. And uh, at that time, all these ideas were regarded as being very, shall I say, flaky. Uh, the distinguished professors sitting in the front row were very skeptical. So we were very careful when we wrote our paper. We said, we do not want to encourage big experimental searches for the Higgs boson. Well, fortunately, our experimental colleagues did not take 
our advice. And uh, together with their accelerator engineer friends, they built the Large Hadron Collider. So uh, here is a picture of the layout of the collider. So it's on the outskirts of Geneva, crossing the border between Switzerland on the right and France on the left. Uh, it's got a circumference of about 27 kilometers. So that explains the large. Uh, hadron, well, that's our word for uh, a strongly interacting nuclear particle. And collider, we try to make lots and lots of collisions between these particles so that we can hopefully answer at least some of Gauguin's questions. So the collider itself is uh, located about 100 meters underground. And uh, this is a view inside the tunnel. So you can see a ring of magnets curving away into the distance. And inside those magnets, we have thousands of billions of protons. Uh, each of them individually has approximately the energy of a fly. They travel very close to the speed of light, but a little bit less. And when the thing is in operation, it produces billions of collisions every second. So then experimental physicists look at those collisions and they try to answer Gauguin's questions. Uh, they try to figure out the origin of mass. They try to look for dark matter particles. They try to understand the plasma that filled the universe when it was a, a tiny fraction of a second old. And they compare the properties of matter and antimatter and try to understand why they're different. So here are some pictures of the uh, large experiments at the Large Hadron Collider. So, so these pictures were all taken over a decade ago while the experiments were still under construction. Operation of the LHC started 10 years ago. Uh, so now you can't see inside the detectors. This is a, a privileged view of what goes on inside. So bottom left and top right, we have two detector, detectors called uh, ATLAS and CMS that co-discovered the Higgs boson and are currently looking for dark matter. Top left, we have an experiment trying to understand the primordial cosmic plasma, which filled the universe just a fraction of a second after the Big Bang. And bottom right, we have LHCb, which is trying to understand the difference between matter and antimatter, which may be connected with the fact that in our universe today, there is matter, but no large amounts of antimatter. So uh, Professor Mohammed uh, is now working with uh, people from the CMS experiment to uh, try to bring Bahrain into that experiment and provide opportunities for some of you students to participate in these experiments. Perhaps before going on, I should just point out in the top right, there is a person. Do you see the person just above the word and? Okay. That's a full-size person. It's, it, it's not a Lego person. Right? Uh, that tells you how large these detectors are. In fact, it's about uh, 25 meters in diameter and almost 50 meters long. Now, now one thing which I would like to emphasize is that the experiments are done at CERN, but not by CERN. They're done mainly by physicists, engineers, and students who come from all over the world. And uh, this is a map showing you uh, where they come from. Uh, something like 13,000 scientists. I don't think that here we have any yet from Bahrain, but that will change. Uh, 
but you can see that we do have uh, physicists from, uh, from the neighborhood. Uh, even Professor Mohammed, we have somebody from Iraq. So, let me now talk a bit about the uh, discovery of the Higgs boson in uh, 2012. So this produced a lot of excitement among particle physicists, which I compare to uh, mass Higgs stereo. So what were the experiments looking for? They were looking for something like this. So uh, this is a computer simulation of a collision at the LHC, which as you can see is quite complicated. Right, so you've got photons coming from top right and bottom left. Uh, they produce lots of charged particles, which are represented by those yellow tracks. They produce lots of neutral particles, represented by those little blue blobs. And what you can see is that there's two big blue blobs on the right-hand side, and two almost straight yellow lines over on the left-hand side. And those in the simulation are the results of a Higgs boson being produced and then decaying into those charged and neutral particles. Sorry, charged particles. So as you can tell, it, it, it's a bit complicated to find a Higgs boson because it, it doesn't sort of walk out the detector and say, salam alaikum. Uh, it is a very unstable particle, it decays very quickly, and all that you can ever hope to do is to see what it decays into. And you have to pick that out amongst dozens of other particles, among you know, billions of collisions. So in 2011 and the first part of 2012, the experiments at Atlas and CMS started seeing some interesting events which looked like they might come from Higgs bosons. So this is one example from Atlas. So you can see those yellow charged tracks again. And you can also see one, two, three, four almost straight red lines. So those are energetic particles which are likely to have come from a Higgs boson. But if you just see one, you can't be sure. Maybe there's some other process that looks like a Higgs boson. And over here, we have an example of an event observed by the CMS experiment. So again, you see the yellow charged tracks, and then you see these red blobs, bottom right and top left. So there's no charged track going there. There's no, that's not a charged particle. That's a neutral particle, probably a photon, maybe again produced by the decay of a Higgs boson. So after observing a number of these events, finally Atlas and CMS decided, well, these have to be you know, some new physics, some new particle. They can't just be fluctuations in the known physics. And so on July the 4th, 2012, they announced the discovery of a new particle. So, this is the scene in the CERN auditorium on what I like to call Higgs Dependence Day. I mind you, this was July the 4th. So uh, you see a bunch of uh, happy physicists. Uh, I would like to call out in particular the gentleman there, second from the left, with his back to you. Uh, and that's Lynn Evans, the guy who actually led the project to build the CERN accelerator. So it's thanks to him that all this is possible. So here's another picture taken on the same day. And I like this picture for two reasons. The first reason is that on the right you see Peter Higgs, and in the middle you see Francois Anglair. So Anglair proposed very similar ideas to Peter Higgs, also in 1964, but they 
never met each other in the intervening 48 years. And I still don't understand how that's possible because physicists are traveling all the, wor the world all the time, conferences, seminars. So how come they never met each other? I don't know, but anyway, finally they met each other. And the other reason why I like this picture is because here, is because here you see Fabiola Gianotti, who presented the Atlas results on that day and uh, is now the Director General of CERN. So, uh, ladies in the audience, there is no glass ceiling at CERN. Okay, so what was discovered on that day was uh, a new particle, but we couldn't be sure that it was really a Higgs boson and not some sort of imposter. So you can compare this to uh, doing a jigsaw puzzle, uh, which particle physicists started in 1897 with the discovery of the electron. And we've been discovering particles, we've been putting together the jigsaw puzzle ever since. But we were stuck for 48 years looking for the Higgs boson. Finally, we find this, this object. It's like a piece of bent cardboard at the back of the sofa with a picture rubbed off. Is that really the missing piece? So the answer is yes. Uh, so this was a, a question that I studied with my then PhD student. Uh, so the Higgs boson is supposed to be responsible for the masses of other particles. That means that its interactions, its couplings with other particles should be proportional to their masses. And so we checked that. So the theoretical prediction is a red line. Our fit to the data is the dashed black line. Perfect agreement. So we wrote in our paper that this particle walks and quacks like a Higgs boson. So this type of analysis has been done subsequently uh, much more accurately with more data by the Atlas and CMS collaborations. And uh, this is their result. So now the red line is not the prediction, it's the fit. And the dashed line is not the fit, it's the prediction. But you can see that they still agree perfectly well. So this particle continued to look like a Higgs boson. So uh, in October 2013, the uh, Nobel Prize Committee uh, gave the Nobel Prize to uh, Peter Higgs and Francois Anglais, who came up with this idea. And uh, they wrote in their citation, today we believe, I'm sorry, I can't do a Swiss accent, a Swedish accent. Today we believe, no. Uh, that beyond any reasonable doubt, it is a Higgs boson. And my student and I were very proud because that quotation was taken from our paper. But what the Nobel Prize Committee didn't know was that when we sent our paper to be published officially in a journal, the referee for the journal said, no, beyond any reasonable doubt, is not a scientific statement. So to get the paper published, we had to take that phrase out. But the Nobel Prize Committee didn't notice, and they quoted us nevertheless. OK, so perhaps it's not scientific. But anyway, beyond any reasonable doubt, it is a Higgs boson. And this is a big deal. Uh, Without the Higgs boson, there will be no atoms, there will be no, uh, no Albert Einstein. Uh, there will be no heavy nuclei, uh, the weak interactions would not be weak, uh, life would be impossible, everything would be radioactive. So as I said, the discovery of this particle was a big deal. So now what? Is there any other new physics that we can see on the horizon? 
So my answer to this is based on James Bond. With a couple of modifications, also paraphrasing the title of his movie, I claim the standard model is not enough. And I give 007 reasons for saying that. If you calculate in the standard model, you find that empty space seems to be unstable. It, the standard model does not explain the dark matter. It doesn't explain the origin of matter. It doesn't explain how large particle masses are. It doesn't describe neutrinos. It doesn't explain why the universe is so big and old. It doesn't provide a quantum theory of gravity. So, there's lots of open, if you like, go gan questions to be answered, and experiments at the LHC are continuing to try to answer them. So I'm just going to say a few words about some of these questions. Will the universe collapse? So I said earlier on that according to our theory, the universe contains this sort of universal field, the Higgs field. Not much of it, actually. And that's represented by that small value of the Higgs field where that red dot is located. That's where we are. But according to our calculations in the standard model, there is another possible state where there's a much, if you like, much deeper uh, layer of Higgs snowfield. And if we were there, then the universe would collapse in a big crunch. So you may say, well, you know, that's their problem. We're on the left, they're on the right. But the problem is that according to quantum mechanics, things are fluctuating all the time. And at some stage, eventually, our universe would tunnel through that barrier and fall into that very dense state, which would be bad news. In fact, there's another aspect of this problem, which is we don't understand how it is that we got to that state on the left in the first place. Because in the very early universe, those quantum fluctuations would have been much more important, and most of the universe would have fallen into this big crunch, and we'd never have got here in the first place. So, here I take a leaf out of the book of Donald Trump. Build a wall! We need some sort of physics beyond the standard model which prevents us from falling into that big crunch. And one such theory is one that I like very much called supersymmetry. So because I like this theory so much, I write it in the biggest font that will fit on the slide. I'm not going to go through all the reasons why I like this theory. Uh, but it, it does make the universe stable. It predicted correctly the mass of the Higgs boson. And, among other things, it provides a candidate for dark matter. So this is a great theory. On the left, we have the particles of the standard model quite a lot of them. On the right, we have the new particles that are predicted by supersymmetry, a whole bunch more. So experimentally, if this theory were correct, it would be a bonanza for our experimental colleagues. So as I will describe in a moment, they've been looking for these supersymmetric particles, but they haven't found them yet. <clears throat> Now, amongst all these particles, 
one of them has to be the lightest one. And that lightest one may provide the astrophysical dark matter. So the existence of dark matter was proposed by Fritz Wicke, whom you see here, uh, back in the 1930s. So he was observing a cluster of galaxies called Coma. He found the galaxies were moving around each other very fast. He calculated the gravity that was provided by the observed galaxies, and he said that gravity is not enough to hold those galaxies together in the cluster. There has to be some additional source of gravity, some other matter, what he called dark matter. So that was the 1930s. I think it was not until the 1970s that people got really interested in this hypothesis, in particular because of this lady, Vera Rubin, who measured the motions of stars inside galaxies. And she found the same thing, that they were moving around very fast and that you needed additional gravity to hold them together, gravity provided by invisible dark matter. So I'd just like to illustrate on this slide what Vera Rubin observed. So on the left of this slide, we have the solar system. So a bunch of planets. I apologize, this includes Pluto. I still kind of like Pluto, but anyway. So you know that according to Kepler's laws, the further you are from the sun, uh, the slower planets move. That's because gravity in the solar system is generated by the sun, and it gets weaker when you go further away. That's not true of a galaxy. So here is the bottom left, the visible part of a galaxy. And then we see the orbital speeds, those little points going across to the right. They don't go down. They don't obey Kepler's laws. And that's telling us that in addition to what we see, called here the stellar disk, there must be other stuff, and that other stuff is the dark matter halo. So what is that dark matter? Uh, maybe it's made of particles. Maybe it's made of supersymmetric particles. Uh, how would we know? So back in the early universe, we think that there would have been a lot of dark matter particles, but most of them would have annihilated into regular standard model particles. What we can hope to do, for example, with the LHC, is to reverse the process. We collide photons, and maybe by colliding standard model particles, we can make dark matter. Or maybe we can observe dark matter particles scattering off nuclei in the laboratory. So let me talk about the LHC search. So this is a computer simulation. So what was simulated here was an event where two protons collided, a bunch of visible particles came off on the right-hand side, but nothing balanced them on the left-hand side, or well, nothing visible, but according to the simulation, there were invisible dark matter particles that escaped the detector as represented by that red line. So Atlas and CMS have been looking for such events. No luck yet. As I said, one could also maybe look for dark matter particles uh, flying through the universe, but not just the universe, flying through this room, flying through you. Uh, of course, they interact very weakly, so you don't notice, um, but uh, if you have a litre bottle of water 
there's a fair chance that at any given instant a dark matter particle might go through it. Again, people look for that. No luck so far. So what else are we doing with the LHC? So whenever CERN produces a press release about antimatter, the newspapers get very excited. I'm not quite sure why. Uh, of course, Professor Rolf sitting there in the third row, he's an expert on antimatter, so uh, he doesn't worry about this. But, but why are people interested in, uh, in antimatter? Is it because they want to power up the Starship Enterprise? Or because of angels and demons? Uh, well, we can't make up, uh, make enough antimatter to power a starship. We can't blow up the Vatican. What we're interested in is why it is that matter and antimatter look ever so slightly different. So back in the 1920s, uh, Dirac pointed out that according to relativity and quantum mechanics, there should exist particles with the same masses but opposite electric charges from conventional particles, antiparticles. These were then discovered first in the cosmic rays and now they're actually used even in medical diagnosis. Now, everybody expected matter and antimatter to be exactly equal and opposite. But experiments say something different. And we don't really understand the reason why. But it was suggested by the Russian physicist Sakharov that this might be related to the fact that in the universe we see lumps of matter, like our planet, for example, but we don't see any lumps of antimatter. And the LHCb experiment at CERN, other CERN experiments, are devoted to studying these differences between matter and antimatter and hoping maybe to find an explanation of why matter dominates in the universe today. So I'm almost through. But I would like to come back to Albert Einstein. So here he is looking a little bit older than in the previous picture, and I fancy maybe a little bit sadder. Doesn't he look sad? Maybe he's sad because he had a premonition that he would never succeed in his dream of making a unified theory of all the fundamental interactions. So that blackboard there does not have a unified theory. So one of the ideas that Einstein worked with was the idea that there might be additional dimensions of space. And this has become very fashionable in recent years uh, with ideas called string theory. And according to some of those ideas, with those extra dimensions, gravity might become strong at the energy scale of the LHC. And if gravity becomes strong, maybe the LHC experiments could make black holes. These would be incredibly small black holes, but black nevertheless. So then some people got very nervous and said, ah, maybe this black hole is going to eat up the entire Earth. So I think that we at CERN should be very grateful to those scaremongers because they got a lot of people interested in the LHC. It's estimated that a billion people watched the startup of the LHC on TV. I don't think it was because of the Higgs boson. I don't think it was because of dark matter. They just wanted to know whether they were going to be destroyed or not. But they shouldn't have worried because the same theory, crazy theory, that predicted the existence of these things, predicted also that they would vanish instantly with no chance of eating anything. And anyway, if these things were produced, they would have been produced 
by those cosmic rays that have been hitting the Earth for billions of years, and we're still here. The sun's still here. No danger. It would be nice if we saw a black hole at the NHC. Anyway, that brings me to the end of my talk. I hope I've convinced you that uh, the NHC is not only a very powerful microscope looking deep inside the structure of matter, but it's also, in some sense, a telescope that may give us the answer to some of Gauguin's fundamental questions. Shukran. So thank you for that question. So if, if you think back to what Newton said, he said weight W is equal to mass M multiplied by gravity G. So basically uh, Einstein had an alternative theory of G, okay, which uh, reduces to Newton's theory for everyday life but has important modifications. So, but, but that theory still did not explain where the M came from. Now, as you say, uh, if you look at Einstein's equations, then it says that this gravity is generated by, well, actually not mass, it's actually generated by, by energy. But if you've got a very slowly moving particle, E is equal to mc squared, and so gravity is generated by mass. But I, I would regard you know, Einstein's theory and you know, the Higgs theory as being entirely complementary. That, that Mr. Higgs, if you like, you know, provides the, the missing piece of Einstein's theory. So, so, so I, I think that your question is, you know, how do we keep antimatter in a box which is made of, of matter? And how do we prevent the antimatter from annihilating uh, with the matter and producing a a flash of radiation. So the, the one-line answer is uh, by a, a clever combination of electric and magnetic fields. It's actually relatively easy to keep an antiproton sitting in a box. Right? And this has been done for, for, for months. Right? What's much trickier is to keep an anti-hydrogen atom because, of course, it doesn't have an electric charge. And I'm not an expert on this. You asked Professor Rolf there in the third row. Uh, First question. The first question is maybe easier. <laughs> so uh, the electric charge is a measure of how strongly something uh, interacts with the electromagnetic field. So uh, we've got electromagnetic fields everywhere, generated by our mobile phones, for example. 
and the charge is a measure of how strongly particles, pieces of matter, feel that electromagnetic field. So, in fact, we think exactly the same thing happens with the origin of mass. That uh, mass is somehow our description of the interaction of a particle with that Higgs field, which stretches out through space in a similar way to the electromagnetic field. So there is actually something which I would regard as being a sort of Higgs charge, and the mass of a particle is given by that Higgs charge times the value of the Higgs field. So it is it's very similar. Now as to the second question, um, why haven't we discovered supersymmetry yet? Well, of course, the simple answer is to say, well, the supersymmetric particles are just a bit heavier. All we have to do is make a few more collisions, or maybe we have to make a higher energy collider. We've got ideas for doing that. Uh, and then maybe we'll find supersymmetric particles. But to be quite honest, we don't know. It could be that supersymmetric particles just don't exist. I mean, it's, it's a hypothesis that could be wrong. And uh, I, I personally feel that it would be a shame if nature didn't exploit this beautiful theory. But, uh, you yeah, know, nature knows best. Well, I, I wish that the answer to your question was as simple as the answer to the question, where is supersymmetry? <laughs> uh, maybe I'd like to come back to this picture. So, so this shows you, you know, the nationalities of all those thousands of scientists working at CERN. And if you look at here, you can see scientists from countries that are in big conflict. Okay. You see uh, scientists from India and from Pakistan. Uh, you see scientists from uh, Iran and the United States. Uh, you see scientists from England and France. That was supposed to be a joke, by the way. So I, I think that w what brings these scientists together is, uh, is a common goal. So I think that's very important. And I think also they're working on something which uh, is not in itself political. It's, it's, it's knowledge, right? So, of course, we all know that knowledge can be misused you know, at some point in the future, although I think you know, there's many more benefits from the knowledge that we've gathered over the centuries than there are uh, bad, uh, bad features. So, you know, I, I don't know how to stop this madness that we see in the world. But I think that if we can, uh, you know, focus on common goals, uh, climate change, for example, and if we can try to, you know, look at those problems from a, a scientific point of view, uh, rather than dragging politics into it, then maybe we would make some progress.
please, anything? Um, hello, uh, I enjoy the lecture. Uh, I have several questions, but keep in mind that I'm an architect, I have nothing to do with physics and physics or something like that. So I think that's something you have. And so also, also, my question would be based on, um, I would say, interests and theories that I've learned from literature, I would say. Um, one would be, I've read a theory that says that consciousness is uh, technically a dark matter. I want to know how true is that uh, or not. And the second question would be if anything that we cannot perceive or, uh, like, as you said in the lecture, that uh, the universe is filled with those uh, dark matter, I would like to know are these dark matter or something beyond our perception or with our perception in a way that they have not been fully formed and that's why they surround the universe. That's ah, and last thing, do multiverses do exist in one way or another? <laughs> okay, so let's quickly run through those questions. So, uh, do multiverses exist? Uh, I don't know. Uh, I personally regard the multiverse as being an uninteresting speculation because I'm interested in things that you can test experimentally in the laboratory. Uh, so I'm not interested in the multiverse. It may exist, I don't know. Uh, consciousness. So I think consciousness it, you know, is a phenomenon that it emerges uh, when you've got a, a very complicated system. It's an, what we call an emergent phenomenon. So, so there are physicists who are interested in how phenomena emerge as something becomes more complicated uh, somehow I, I look in the opposite direction. I try to reduce things to the simplest possible elements uh, and try to understand what the basic building blocks are. Uh, so I'm not an expert on consciousness. And I, I don't think it has anything to do with dark matter. I think dark matter is a problem for us you know, reductionist uh, people. Um, was there another question? Okay, that's, that's yeah. okay thank you very much, Professor Jones. For your talk, and thank you for all. Thank you very much.